five, four, three, two, one. Well, since my last update, I've been back to the Queen Mary twice. On November 5th, my friend and maritime historian Sean Dake provided a lecture for the local chapter of the Steamship Historical Society of America on the lamented SS Catalina. During that same meeting, current chairperson Kate Vissera presented past chair Bruce Vansell with the H. Graham Wood Award for his stewardship of the chapter, which has more or less been active since 1946. It now thrives with quarterly meetings that are held aboard the Mary. And just a few days later, Professor Bruce Peter came all the way from the Glasgow School of Art to provide a lecture on the Clyde built ships and the magnificent Mary herself. Both of these events gave me ample time to explore more of the ship, which has been a favorite pastime of mine for longer than I'd like to admit. Although her restoration is still underway, with much more work to be done, she still manages to look better with each passing day. Her hull and the two forward funnels now glisten in the afternoon sun. Plans are actually underway to repaint the third, which has been peeling since a coat of red covered the freshly applied orange without being properly primed. This was done by prior management, who preferred the new, historically incorrect Cunard Red to the classic Cunard Orange. As the saying goes, all in due course. So let's head aboard and have a look at some of the spaces I was able to capture since the last video. Guided tours begin at the promenade deck entrance near one of her massive bronze bells, which is mounted alongside several commemorative plaques including one for her 1993 induction in the National Register of Historic Places. Let's start our tour at the Model Gallery on the forward starboard promenade, which features three astoundingly detailed cutaway models by Father Roberto Pironi. His Titanic and Lusitania models are nothing short of breathtaking. The amount of work and his dedication to capturing every element of these two ill-fated four-stackers is unsurpassed. Well, okay, if they have been surpassed, then that would be by Pironi's Normandy, the Queen Mary's one-time rival. It took him 16 years to build this masterpiece. Directly inboard, along the starboard companionway leading to the observation bar, elements of the original first-class nursery that once occupied this space are on display. Inboard and aft of the observation bar, visitors and hotel guests alike can enjoy the game room at the observation bar, which was carved out of the forward funnel hatch. Now let's head a few steps aft to the main hall, which I briefly covered in the last update. Forward and center is the former centerline shop, which is now the office of Queen Mary's honorary Commodore Everett Howard. Here there are various treasures on display from the ship's archive that the good Commodore enjoys sharing with appreciative visitors. On the starboard side, the former first-class drawing room is now a gift shop. Don't miss the onyx fireplace and the gorgeous painting by the renowned Kenneth Shoesmith on its aft bulkhead. A top-notch impressionist, Shoesmith's evocative paintings of ships and travel landscapes are known throughout the world. And just aft of that, the small kiosk now serves as a tour office. In between the shops, there's a sitting area and an Art Deco stanchion 
that once graced the first-class restaurant. And now on to the port side. Here you'll find the former first-class library with its lustrous oak burr, sycamore, and ebonized oak paneling. It served as a gift shop since the Queen Mary first called Long Beach her home. Here's another view of the main hall, which looks resplendent with its newly restored linoleum decking and much warmer LED lighting. Directly aft and center, the former first-class staircase leads down to the hotel. In the starboard vestibule leading aft to the Queen's Lounge, display cases now feature wooden carvings by Bainbridge Copenhagen and Norman Forrest that were originally from the Long Gallery and the first-class smoking room vestibule, respectively. In the flies above the ladies' room in this passage, which was a post-war writing room addition, plexiglass panels celebrate a writing theme by an anonymous craftsman hired by Waring and Jillo, the London firm contracted by Cunard, to decorate most of the Mary. In the corresponding port vestibule, there are also some nice displays of in-service items. And don't forget to look up on this side, where more of those etched plexiglass panels celebrate radio communication over what was once the radio and telephones room, added after World War II. One of the most epic spaces on the Mary, or any ship ever for that matter, the Queen's Salon is the former first-class lounge. Burled maple and Macquarie paneling frames this 30-foot tall space, which boasts a unicorn frieze by Gilbert Bays and A.J. Oakley that has flaps that can be opened from a hidden projection booth for film screenings. Hovering over this space are spectacular etched glass and nickel light fixtures that were created by Paul Guiu for the General Electric Company. Exquisite detailing includes sculpted alabaster sconces and a series of five nickel bronze reliefs over the proscenium and fore and aft entrances by Maurice Lambert, depicting musical themes and the abduction of Prosperina by Pluto. Lambert, sculpted in all types of media, contributed to the 1928 and 1948 Olympics and taught at the Royal Academy of Art. Every nook in this magnificent space seduces the eye with a brilliant example of Art Deco craftsmanship and artistry. On either side, there are onyx electric fireplaces topped with breathtaking mirrors by London Sandblast Decorative Glassworks with acid etched and cut musical and theatrical motifs in peach and white. I hope you'll agree this is truly a space of superlatives and that we are so lucky to have it in our 21st century realm. Continuing aft along the port promenade, the coffee shop occupies a portion of the former first-class long gallery. Its forward bulkhead still features the Sussex landscape painting by Bertram Nichols and behind the counter there's a circus painting by Dame Laura Knight that was originally in one of the private first-class dining rooms. Don't miss Paul Guiu's stunning General Electric ceiling fixtures and the counter, which has colors and Greek key decorative motifs inspired by the midship's bar that occupied this space in the ship's latter Cunard years. The long gallery continues aft with the boardroom, which I showed in the last video. Its farthest staff portion is now the Regent Room, which houses Evening on the Avon by Algernon Newton. Located at the aft end of the former first-class portion of Promenade Deck, the Royal Salon was originally the first-class smoking room. Two Dolly-S paintings by Edward Wadsworth dominate its central portion. Wadsworth was a leader of the modernist vorticism movement. He also helped create the dazzle camouflage paint on merchant and warships that confounded enemy U-boat captains 
in the First World War. And if you look closely, you'll find the Queen Mary is featured in both of these works. The other key artworks here are three pierced and carved wooden screens by James Woodford, OBE, a celebrated sculptor from Nottingham. As with the Long Gallery, this space was designed by Messrs. Trollope and Sons with tiger oak burr, walnut, and bronze elements to give it an English country house feel. And while we gaze at the rafters, I want to add that for simplicity, I've used the term first class, realizing that before the war, these spaces were called cabin class. The aft promenade deck vestibule that leads to the men's room contains another Art Deco masterpiece in a series of glass panels depicting the history of transportation by Sigmund Pollitzer, a London-based painter and decorative glass designer who fashioned works for several London hotels. These fanciful panels depict everything from sleek airplanes and streamlined ocean liners to steam locomotives, automobiles, stagecoaches, galleons, and caravels. And of course, this one would probably be my favorite. As we work our way down into the hotel accommodations, I should also explain that this part of the ship was originally called tourist class, but was later known as cabin class, which is especially confusing since the original cabin class was later called first class. And all you die-hard Queen Mary fans, please bear with me as I should also explain that her original third class, which we'll see a bit of soon, was later called tourist class. It truly is confusing, but there you go. That beautiful woodwork framing this stair tower in these panels is Pomel Sapel and was installed by the team at Waring and Jillo. Okay. I'm going to let the music play for a bit, and I'll be back shortly. gorgeous original linoleum is on B deck. While the panels continue down into what is now crew area, I'm going to wrap these up here. And just for comparison, here's a sample of a frosted glass panel in the first class stairs. Now let's go back to the aft stairs and head to the main deck vestibule, which once housed the latter day cabin class shop. On its forward side, there was a library and writing room, now storage space, and a long since gone playroom. On the starboard side, you can still see the teak decking from the enclosed cabin class promenade. Just after there, that same promenade has since been incorporated into what is now the Britannia Salon. A nice touch here is the use of light fixtures from the former cabin class dining room. The forward portion of the Britannia somewhat belies the glories of the room's aft portion, although some of the light fixtures and a striking glass panel which I'll come back to are Art Deco wonders. The aft and center part of the room, which I show set up for a lecture and a banquet, features a 16-foot high dome paneled in leather. Like the first-class long gallery and smoking room, this space was designed by Messrs. Trollope and Sons. Set within the dome are seven paintings on Hyde depicting Dance Through the Ages by Miss Margot Gilbert. Gilbert was the daughter of famed sculptor Walter Gilbert and studied at the Royal Academy. She's probably best known for these works. And for good measure, here's a forward-facing view to put them all into context with two more that are on the forward bulkhead, framing one of my favorite works of art on the ship.
That exquisite favorite piece would be this etched glass niche mirror in green glass executed by London Sandblast Decorative Glassworks Limited from a design by Miss Gilbert. And now let's go out and grab some fresh sea air on Queen Mary's outer decks, some of which are still being spruced up after the hiatus. The removal of those weathered plexi screens on prom deck provides a nice vantage over the bow and back up towards the curvaceous superstructure. The wheelhouse is open once again, but only for guided tours, so I hope to catch one next time. And yes, the bridge wings are still closed off, patiently awaiting restoration, but the views from bridge deck, fore and aft, are inspirational. The restoration of the next lower level sports deck is well underway, with T cap rails and decking getting much needed TLC. In the former deck tennis area, the unsanded starboard side looks like the dark side of the moon compared to the freshly sanded port side. And no, those replacement funnels from the Long Beach conversion are not aluminum, despite what some ship historians say. At some point, fiberglass replicas of the missing lifeboats may once again fill those empty davits, but the decking on sun deck is actually looking good again. Now let's head aft where there's also been a lot of progress in cleaning up the ship over the past few months. Work is still ongoing, but the stern deck areas improve with each visit. And now let's head back up to sun deck to what has been described as Queen Mary's Holy Grail space. The Veranda Grill was once the a la carte dining venue for the ship's most celebrated passengers. It also had a cocktail bar and served as an exclusive nightclub, which was downgraded to a hot dog stand when the Mary first came to Long Beach. Thankfully, that hot dog purgatory is now a distant memory. The balustrade surrounding the dance floor features brilliant cut and acid etched musical motifs, some in silvered glass, all manufactured by London Sandblast Decorative Glassworks. London Sandblast also created the stunning ceiling fixture of the Four Winds in peach and luna blue glass. Last and certainly not least are a series of canvas paintings by Doris and Anna Zinkhuizen depicting pantomime, the theater, and the circus. There are three large Zinkhuizen paintings on the aft bulkheads and two corner paintings each on the port and starboard side. Far more than just one of the contributing artists, Doris Zinkhuizen actually designed the veranda grill itself. Zinkhuizen was a Scottish writer, theatrical designer, and painter. She was a member of the Royal Institute of Oil Painters, while her costume designs were featured on stage and in film, and she worked with the likes of Noel Coward, Cole Porter, Sir Ralph Richardson, and Sir Lawrence Olivier. During World War II, she served as a nurse tending to blitz casualties, and in 1945, she documented the atrocities at the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. More than just a beautiful Art Deco space, the Veranda Grill is both rich in history and a monument to a fascinating and talented woman. Now let's head all the way to the opposite end of the ship on A deck, where guests are greeted with this quote from legendary maritime author and historian John Maxstone Graham. Cunard liners, not just transportation, but a way of life. Occupying what was originally the third and later the tourist class smoking room, 
The newly reopened Cunard Story exhibit celebrates Cunard Line's heritage before, during, and after the Queen Mary. Displays contrast life on the original queens with today's cruise ship queens. And other liners like the Franconia, Coronia, and Mauritania are featured in images and ephemera as well. On the outer port side of the Cunard story, which also leads out to the well deck, some of the Queen Mary's navigation and safety equipment is on display. While we're up forward, here's an interesting original portion of the stairs and lobby outside of the tourist class restaurant. Now let's take a walk through the hotel area along the Port B Deck Companionway with its beautifully lit woodwork and Bakelite railings in the former first class accommodations ending in the former cabin class lobby we saw earlier. In a second you'll notice how the paneling abruptly ends in cabin class which was completely rebuilt in the Long Beach conversion to provide larger, modern hotel rooms. Of course, these rooms have less charm than the originals, but they're also available at a lower price. To the lament of many ship lovers, when the Queen Mary came to Long Beach, much of her powerful steam plant was scrapped to make room for convention space, but what remains of her engine room is still well worth visiting. Accessed on what was originally aft D deck, the engine room can be enjoyed on a guided or self-guided tour. Let's head to the forward end of the lobby where an anchor and one of her builder's plates are located and then down the stairs into the heart of her aft engine room. Originally there were five boiler rooms that provided the steam to power her engines, but they were scrapped along with her forward engine room. This is the main control panel with its repeaters, myriad valves, and gauges. And here's an engine control telegraph and an auxiliary steering station. Interesting displays in this part of the ship include ephemera and in-service items from the Queen Mary's fleetmates and competitors. But my favorite part is the propeller box, where one of her mighty bronze screws can be observed in its watery element. I'm going to wrap up this update with a visit to the steering gear area, which is just a few steps aft. Well, I hope you enjoyed this look at more of the Majestic Mary. Of course, I've barely scratched the surface, and there is still so much more to see. In the meantime, I'm so happy and relieved that this historic ship is getting some much-needed love and repairs. Until next time, I'll leave you with some parting words from my friend and colleague, Dr. Bruce Peter. And it's wondrous. It's absolutely wondrous when I, uh, when the cab drove along the 
waterfront and we came up to the hull, I, I really had a lump in my throat. It's uh, amazing to see for real. Here we are, uh, the best part of 90 years later on board the Queen Mary, which is in rude health, looking great, and my old mother is as well. So two uh, important things to me that were created in Glasgow in 1936, uh, both still here and I love both of them. I mean, you get this real sense amongst everybody working on board, all the people who look after the ship, not just the older ones who've been here for years or decades, but young guys and women in their 20s, you know, they, it means a lot to them as well. And that's very touching and very wonderful to see. It bodes well for the future. Thank <laughs> you.